How's it going, everyone? Uh, welcome to the first ever Meet the Musician live stream brought to you by the musicians of the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra. My name is Sam Rothstein, assistant principal clarinetist and bass clarinetist with the Indianapolis Symphony Orchestra, and I will be your host for the evening. So we're super excited for this new series. It's going to be every Tuesday night starting at 8 p.m. Eastern. And my inspiration for sort of creating this series was a way for us to connect with our patrons and our community when we can't be in close proximity and see you guys in person. Um, and we also just wanted a way for our patrons and su subscribers and donors to get to know the musicians on sort of a deeper level um, than just their musical performances, because a lot of people just know us based on what we do on the stage and maybe saying hi to us backstage or after a concert. And I think this is a great way for us to just talk with our colleagues and musicians from the uh, uh, musicians of the Indianapolis Symphony and just meet them and get to know them as people and what they do and where they're from. And I think it's gonna be a great way for our audience to do this. Um, so if you haven't been to our website, isomusicians.org, make sure to check out our website and subscribe to our newsletter. That's where you're gonna find everything having to do uh, with our latest uh, projects and concerts that we're uh, putting together. Uh, so make sure to check out our website. And then our new thing is obviously our partnership with Twitch. And we've been so fortunate um, that Twitch has made us an affiliate. And so uh, the first thing you can do is follow us on Twitch by clicking the little uh, icon with the heart on it. Uh, it says follow. And what you can do is you can make a free account. And one thing that you could do that would really help us out is by connecting your Twitch account to Amazon to your Amazon Prime account. And what this allows you to do is subscribe to us for free every 30 days. And that really helps support the stream and support the musicians of the Indianapolis Symphony. So you can subscribe, subscribe to us for free every 30 days and make sure to connect your Twitch account to your Amazon Prime account, hit that subscribe button, and you know, making sure that we can keep doing these kinds of things. And then another thing you can do to help us out is following us on social media. As you can see, at ISO Musicians, we have a Twitter account, Facebook, Instagram, always giving constant updates on there, uh, introducing you in written form to our musicians. And yeah, it's uh, we're, we're just increasing our online presence, and we have a lot of exciting things coming up. So of course, our first musician that we wanted to introduce to everybody is our newest musician, and that is our new concertmaster, Kevin Lynn. And Kevin officially joins us in September. You've probably seen him on stage for the last couple of years. He's been sort of in and out playing guest concertmaster with us. Um, but he was officially hired in January, and he starts officially in September. So we wanted to take this opportunity to sort of get to know Kevin and uh, just find out who he is. And he comes to us from across the pond where he was the co-leader of the London Philharmonic Orchestra. But actually, he's from the United States, so he's... This is sort of going to be a homecoming for him in a way. So without further ado, let's bring in Kevin. Kevin, how you doing, man? Hey. Hey, Sam. Yeah. Man, yeah, things are good. That was an amazing intro, by the way. Oh, I don't know thanks. if I could have done that. That's, wow. Yeah. That's a mouthful. But well done, well done, well thanks. done. Thanks. It's my hey, first nice time. Nice to see so. everybody. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So we're really glad you can join us. Um, and by the way, I wanted to mention, if you guys have any questions, make sure to type them in the chat, and we'll try to answer as many questions as possible um, we'll try to get to as many people as we can uh, in the time that we have. Um, but the first thing I wanted to ask you, Kevin, is what have you been up to during quarantine and COVID times? I know it's been kind of a crazy time for everybody. Um, you know, what is what have, what have you been doing? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so I was actually supposed to finish out the season with with London. So I'm technically supposed to be back in London right now. Mm -hmm. I, I gave them my final notice that I was supposed to supposed to finish at the end of august but you know we got the we, we we basically got an email saying hey it's not safe to work anymore in in early march um and then we're kind of just expected to wait around mm -hmm. um that being said i was i was in london by myself at the time my wife who's also a musician uh, a violinist a great violinist um plays with the cincinnati symphony orchestra mm -hmm. And so she's she's been in the states, and uh, and my parents are in the states. Uh, so I there was really no reason for me to stick around London, especially if work was gonna, uh, you know, and in, be indefinitely canceled until until things get better. I think. Yeah. Um, 
so I've been I've I've been in the states ever since since March, and I've just been one town over in in Cincinnati. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, finally playing playing catch up with with you know with my wife, and uh, it's yeah. it's it's been good. So I've 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 just been I've just been around uh, being the house husband, which has been amazing. Yeah, uh, I've had the same <laughs> opportunity. You know, I, I get to do all the grocery shopping. Uh, well, I shouldn't say all yeah. the grocery shopping. My wife certainly does her fair share of everything, but. Um, yeah. grocery shopping and cooking and you know taking care of the dog it's it's been kind of nice to do my own projects you know and 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 have sort of my own time and i think this time has sort of allowed people to you know i, I would always say oh man if i only had you know two months to just not do anything i could do this and so the exactly, world exactly. the world sort of presented us with this opportunity to do exactly that and so for sure for um sure. and so yeah it's, it's nice to hear that someone else has been sort of taking advantage of that time as well and you've also been playing some concerts uh, around indianapolis can you sort of explain what you've been doing yeah so actually terry langdon who's a phenomenal violist in, the, in, in our in our orchestra uh she came to me with the idea one day i just out of the blue sent me an article I forgot if it was the new york times or something it sent me an article about people doing safe socially distanced concerts mm-hmm. And then um, I thought, and when I first got this email, I thought it was just someone like sharing the news and everything. You know, when yeah. like everyone was sharing coronavirus news, so like there's only so much coronavirus news you can take before you start like span like you know just writing off these emails. But she sent me this this article, and it was basically it was like, Kevin, do you think we could do something like this? Yeah. And this is and this is the first time that someone was like, uh, you know, like let's let let's do something about this. And I haven't, I haven't, like, like again, like I haven't started for indie yet. So this was kind of, this was kind of a surprise to me. But I was like, ah, oh, this is perfect. I'm like one town over. I'm about a hundred miles away. But like, we can totally make something work. Yeah. Um, so we've been, we, uh, Terry and I came up with uh, some basic guidelines that we wanted to follow. So like, we first and foremost, it, it has to absolutely be as safe as possible because health and well-being of our colleagues and our friends and also the audience um, is, is paramount. Yes. So we, we did the whole, uh, you know, masks have to be required. We limited uh, the uh, audience size. So it would be 250 people total, including, uh, including the players. Uh, and on top of that, social, social, social distancing. And, you know, so we've been making sure everything is, uh, everything is run smoothly and safely. And it was kind of cool because, like, usually I'm the guy that kind of just walks on stage and plays. Yeah. Usually we have we have an amazing you know management team that sets everything up for us, and basically all I have to do is like like I said like just get on stage and play. Um, so Terry and I have been sp- splitting our duties doing. And Terry's like making the connections with with the personnel and uh, you know where to play, and I've kind of been manning the RSVP lines and like sending out the social media stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, so seriously, like this was this was definitely Terry's idea that I kind of just helped along the way a little bit with logistics. Um, but it, it, it's it's amazing, yeah. So we, we've done uh, two socially uh, was the, the exact term like socially distanced safe concerts. Yeah. Um, and so we we have been uh, basically doing strings only for now because of the of the mandatory masks. Um, it would be, it, I'm assuming for you, it'd be kind of hard to to play clarinet through a through a through a mask. Yeah, I you know we actually have done a couple. Uh, so uh, one of our clarinetists, Trina Gross, is a second clarinetist. She mm-hmm. actually organized a trio concert just for her neighborhood. It was just like a kind of a cold sac concert, uh, and so we Maybe. did play together. But we made sure you know we were spaced out, even you know outdoors, always outdoors too, spaced out outdoors. Um, yeah. And, you know, we, I think we had like 40, 50 people, something like that. So it was a nice turnout, but, but everyone was, you know, spread out. And yeah, I think that's, yeah. that's what's paramount right now is just making sure people are safe. Um, and, that's, and then, yeah, of that's... course, there was a brass concert. Um, yes, whatever. the brass, it was that yesterday. Uh, or no, 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 Sunday. Ago. Yeah, Sunday. two days ago. And it was, uh, it, was inc- I, it was incredible. That was insane. Yeah, it was, it was amazing. amazing. It was amazing. It was incredible. I but... saw the... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. I, sorry. I, I saw the little, uh, the, from, from our Instagram page, we, there's people sending in stories. I mean, it sounds it sounds it sounds incredible, yeah. and I think it we're you know we're we're so lucky to be part of an organization that is so diverse in their repertoire, and we can bring such diverse music to uh, to Indianapolis. Um, and 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 on top of that, I think they would that concert was uh, was done in conjunction with North Northminster uh, Presbyterian. Yep. 
as a uh, fundraiser for Gleaner's uh, Food Bank. Yeah. And they raised almost $1,500 just from that one night, um, which is incredible. It's amazing. And you know, that's that's one thing that we want to do as, as the musicians of the Indianapolis Symphony is we want to, you know, provide music to our community uh, and support people most in need in this time. Uh, so not only mm-hmm. do we want to bring musical healing, but also, you know, whatever way we can help, you know, whether it's a fundraiser or just, um, you know, helping people enjoy you know, life again. I know it's been kind of kind of a tough time, and just you know, bringing that musical healing yeah. to our community is, is really important. Mm-hmm. Um, so great. Uh, can you can you describe to us sort of where you're from and 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 where you went to school? Like, how did you get here? You know, how'd you how'd you end yeah, up? Yeah, <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, that's 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 a we could talk about this for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> um, but <laughs> but basically, I I was born in New York City. Uh, my my parents were uh, my parents were in school there. My parents are scientists, so. Okay. Uh, they were working at, they were I think they were students at Columbia University when they had me um, but I grew up in the tri-state area they you know they moved I grew up in North New Jersey in a little town called Tenafly, Tenafly New Jersey um, and it just so happened that there was a little there's a there's a well size wise it's little but like it's, it's a great music school in the town of Tenafly it's the uh, Turnhour School of Music and it's associated with the uh, Jewish Community Center over there okay. so I basically uh, started my violin training there, and it's really funny because, like, I'm still friends with a lot of the people that I was in like group class with when I was in six, yeah. uh, when I was six, six years old. Um, but, anyways, I, I have to I have to give credit to uh, to the school for basically giving me the foundation that I need. Um, and I basically went through the school until I went until ninth grade, uh, so long time at that school. Mm-hmm. When I, I studied at the Manhattan School of Music Pre College Division, where I was a student of uh, Patinka Kopeck. and that's kind of where like my love for this whole entire thing, for for music came about. I, it's it's um, it's like this fairy tale thing, you know, like the little kid from New Jersey yeah. driving into New York City, and you get to see like all these like, oh wow, you're in New York City, and you're studying violin there. It's it, it kind of is a dream come true. So I always. Um, yeah, that was, that was that was like the dream for me. I always I always looked forward to Saturdays because like I can be like a real artsy cultured person. Yeah, I can go definitely. into New York City and, and and have my violin lessons and like hang out with all the kids that went to school in uh, in New York. You know, all the prep schools and all that. Um, it was really cool. Uh, so I did. I was there for uh, for like four years until college, and then in college, I went to. Uh, the Colburn Conservatory in, in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. Um, and I met you know, amazing people there, amazing friends. Uh, I mean, it's a small world. Uh, I met our principal uh, cellist there, Austin Huntington. Yep. Austin went to Colburn as well. Uh, Austin went to Colburn and also uh, Conrad, yep. uh, principal trumpet. Conrad Jones, yep. Yeah, I, I, I must be missing some other people, but there, there's, some, there's some great Colburn connections out there. Um, did my undergrad out of there. I had an amazing time. Met my wife there. Um, yeah, I mean, I probably like screwed around more than I practiced, but like, <laughs> we all did. like it, it, we all did. I mean, none, none of us actually talk about it because, like, you know, on stage we we seem like these people that are like so serious, take everything super seriously. But like, I mean, in you know, in real life we're basically we're just like everybody else we probably did the same things in college mm-hmm. not practice and that kind of stuff but um we practice when, when we needed to yeah and i think to for every musician uh i've i started a podcast recently and just it's interesting talking to people and, and a lot of them are just like well i hit this point where just i had to turn it on you know like you, yeah, it, it yeah, was yeah. either it was either fight or flight either you had to do it and become a musician or you didn't and so we all, yeah. and so mine was like, I'd say probably my junior year in college where I was just like, bang, it's time. Like, let's go, you know? And so I'm yeah, sure you, yeah, yeah. you had a similar experience. I had a similar experience. Yeah, for sure. Like I, first of all, I thought, I, I thought getting to that school was a mistake because I, I didn't feel like I was good enough to be at that school. Um, it's a very small school. It's about a hundred kids mm-hmm. and everyone who goes there was on full scholarship. And like, it, it was, it was it was cloud nine. It, it should, this, this place is like too good to be true from a financial standpoint. And from what I understand too, isn't it, they basically just have enough people to like fill out an orchestra. That's, that's like their, exactly. their, yeah. That's the, I, I don't know if it's changed in the, in the past couple of years. I've, I haven't been there, but 
when I was there, yeah, it was basically just enough strings and winds to basically found or oh, plus a piano program. Can't forget about the piano program. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, and I, I remember basically I was when I got there, I was like enjoying LA because like who doesn't? Mm -hmm. uh, and then I remember like <laughs> having a coaching with the uh, viola professor there, uh, Paul Coletti, and he completely destroyed me like completely 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 destroyed me and he had, he was he was right to do it like you know i was this probably this entitled kid who totally took advantage of the situation and did not practice as as, as hard as i should mm -hmm. and so like without going into too much detail he like i'm pretty sure he was trying to make me cry i don't cry very easily <laughs> but like i can tell he was he was trying really hard you're the opposite of and me because so i've definitely cried in some lessons before yeah. <laughs> no I'm, I'm i'm yeah I don't, I don't know what's wrong with me. I, it's just hard for me to, to, to cry at violin lessons. Uh, but anyways, at the, end of, at the end of the concert, he came up to me. He was just like, you know, you, you, you got to learn under fire. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I was actually super appreciative of like what he had like done for me. Because mm -hmm. if, if I wasn't doing it for myself, someone needed to be there to push me. Um, so it was just funny that it came from a, a, a teacher that, you know, was a viola teacher. I, yeah. I wasn't studying with him. Um, so I, I still, to this day, I, I really appreciate him for it. Yeah. And then it's also uh, the other great thing about being in a small school is you're always around peers who constantly push you. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I think you learn just as much from who you are in school with as who you study with. Um, so I have to, you know, give a lot of props to the, to my friends and colleagues that were there at the time. Like if, if they weren't there, I probably wouldn't be half the musician I am today. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sure it's the same for you. Um, Absolutely. I mean, I, for, for, for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, then, I, yeah, so, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I just, no, no, I've no. always felt, I mean, I love my teachers to death, but I've always felt that I've learned more and continue to learn more from colleagues and fellow students than I ever could hope to learn from yeah, teachers. Sure, absolutely. And it's just this sort of symbiotic, you know, thing where you, you're all kind of in it together and you have to rely on each mm -hmm. other and, you know, it, like one of my favorite things to do is sort of sit in our clarinet section and just like hear someone do something really amazing. And I kind of look over and I just, I try to see what they're doing and try to learn how to do what they're doing so that I can apply it to my yeah. own playing. And that's something you, yeah. I mean, you can get that from listening to your teacher or lessons or whatever, but, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but experiencing it from a colleague is very powerful. I think so. Yeah, absolutely. I think experience is actually what drives our art form because or any art form mm -hmm. in that respect uh you know a lot of what we do is what we witness and what we see in our experiences from you know experiences that we had or people other performers um and i think that's why it's so amazing to always see different conductors every week i mean yeah. it, we're really lucky to have the principal conductor that we have now but we also regularly see guest conductors mm -hmm. um and all of these people whether they're from I don't know Europe, Asia, other places in America, wherever they bring the experiences that they had and they share it with the orchestra here. So that's one source of uh, inspiration for us. But also the type of people that the Indianapolis Symphony hires is you know our backgrounds are all all very diverse. Mm -hmm. um, and you know with oops the orchestra the orchestra grows into this new all good. Yeah, you're good. Yeah, sorry, you just cut out yeah, the little foot. We're good. Yeah, I know. So, I, yeah. so with every little, with every new member that joins us, you know, they they bring their experiences, and you know, they provide a lot of uh, guidance and input and inspiration for you know everyone around them. And this is kind of how our orchestra grows. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I yeah, definitely, definitely need experiences and different types of cultures, and mm -hmm. yeah. So, so after Colburn, where, where did you go from there? Ah, so after the Colburn, I went to the Curtis Institute of Music, actually. Mm -hmm. So I went back, back east. I did, I did two years there, but I actually never graduated formally. I feel like nobody ever graduated. They all go to that <laughs> school and then they never graduate from it. We never graduated. You guys, well, you guys yeah. are all too good. You just get jobs before you even have no, a chance to get No, 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 no. Well, I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, maybe the other people. I don't know about me. But, uh, <laughs> But basically, yeah, so I, I had my first year there. I was studying with Aaron Roseanne. That was perfect. It was amazing. And also, um, yeah, that was just like a fairly standard school year. Mm -hmm. But I remember at the end, uh, I think I, I must have been like 20, 
like 22 or 23 it's just when like you know when you're when all of your friends start getting jobs yeah and then you start to feel the pressure and then you start to contemplate it's like what the hell am i doing with my life yeah, yeah um yeah. so i actually uh, so the end of my first year of uh of curtis i i freaked out i freaked out because i had friends uh nathan chan in this in the seattle yeah. symphony yeah. um Will Chow and the Pittsburgh, all these guys are like doing great things, winning great jobs. Um, and then I was just, I was just like 24, 23, 24 year olds. Like I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm just like playing violin. Mm -hmm. And so I started sending resumes like everywhere. Thank God for musical chairs and audition cafe. Yeah. <laughs> like I, I, I literally sent everything that I could like possibly I could, you know, I could see every, every situation I could see myself in. Um, so the funny story is I actually, there was a, um, there was a, a, a job posting for substitute violins at the London Philharmonic Orchestra. Okay. There's, there's, there's a substitute position and I sent, uh, so I sent my resume and I was like, oh, it'd be kind of cool to just kind of go to, I've never been to London. It'd be cool to just go for a couple of weeks you know, mm -hmm. at a time if they need a substitute or anything. Um, but I need input into this story. I actually met the London Philharmonic in Los Angeles when I was a student at Colburn. And I was, you know, teachers tell you to schmooze and all that kind of stuff. So, of course, like, yeah. I put a fair share of, like, hey, I'm Kevin Lynn. Like, <laughs> please remember me. Um, okay. So, now that you know that part, go back to go back to Curtis. Um, so, I sent this resume, um, not really expecting anything from it. Um, but about two months passed, and the... Uh, the concert master of the London, London Philharmonic uh, actually wrote me an email, like a direct email responding to my resume. I was like, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, basically, he's like, well, we can't, well, obviously it doesn't make sense financially for us to like hire you as, as, as a substitute, but we're looking for a co-leader. Would you be interested? Um, I was like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> of course. yeah, like all my friends are like making like money and like, playing great orchestras, making great music. Like, I need to do something in my life. Um, so they're like, yeah, just fly to London, come play an audition for us, and then we'll, we'll, we'll talk from there. So went to, flew to, uh, flew to London in, like, July of 2016, I think. Mm -hmm. played, a, played an audition for the entire orchestra there on their lunch break. They were, half of them were, like, literally eating out of Tupperware, like, <laughs> listening to my audition. And I walk in with a full suit and tie and everything, um, and I played for them, and yeah, it, it it happened to you know work out for me that day. Well, I, I I think a lot of audition has to do with luck, you know, big time. Um, big time. Every because everyone who auditions at that point is is amazing. Yeah, they're all good. It's amazing. So you have to be right place, right time, um, and that happened to, to to work out for me. So uh, yeah, and then the the audition process in London is slightly different than what we're used to in the states. So in, in London, there is one round of auditions. So that's, you know, you just play your audition. But then after that, they pick about five to six trialists given mm -hmm. on or, or, or as many as they, they, they feel comfortable with or are happy with. Um, and then throughout and then after that is the trial process. So they have each mem each uh, trialist come in for a couple weeks at a time um, just to see if, if you know if they fit into the orchestra uh london orchestras work a lot and they, yeah. and they tour a lot so the thing is like when you're hiring someone you're basically picking someone to be part of your family because you're seeing these people more than you see your actually actual family uh, so it was a lengthy it was a lengthy uh trial process that took about a year for me to 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 win so i i, I did multiple so that's why i wasn't there the second year of curtis this this goes back to that um, and so because my entire second year of Curtis, I was basically doing flying back and forth between Philadelphia and London doing, uh, trial patches. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, a year later and it perfectly coincided with the end of Curtis that like, they're like, Hey, Kevin, you want to come full time next year? I was like, yes. <laughs> right. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. And then, uh, and then, yeah. And then it worked out. But the thing is like, Curtis is like, wait, but you haven't done your grad recital. Oh, no. <laughs> and at that point, I was like, I, I, I got, I, I got an offer from London Phil, and I was like, Am I really gonna practice for a grad recital? <laughs> You're done. Probably, yeah, uh, yeah, I was like, I was like, thank you, thank you, thank you, Curtis, but like, I, I'm not in the right headspace to do a final recital right now. Yeah. 
Well, cool, man. Sounds like you had quite a quite a cool experience. Actually, we have a question in the chat from Yoshi Baby Kitty. Uh, do yeah. you prefer UK or Europe's audition process over the US? Like, which one is preferable to you? I think there, there's no perfect system. There is no, absolutely no perfect system. You know, in the way the way we test in in the states, especially with multiple rounds, and given that it's a blind audition, I think it's much more rigorous in the states, but it's a much more fair process. Um, only because you know we won't we won't see who the uh, who the winner is until we've declared a winner. So I think, you know, from if you want to talk about a fairness point of view, that is the most fair way to do it because we literally have no idea who the candidate is until we like, oh, we want this person. Yeah. Um but that being said, like it's a, it's a lot of pressure to perform perfectly for like two to three or four rounds. Like it's yeah. not it's not representative of what we actually do on the job. Um cuz like we're we're not, you know, when, when we're actually playing an orchestra, we don't have to play like an hour's worth of music perfectly. Yeah. You know, we strive we strive for it, but not everybody that's not reality. So I think the way they, they test in London is the benefit in London is that you actually have more chances to prove yourself. Mm -hmm. Um and also a lot of it, you know, after the actual audition round is a lot of it is personality based. Uh you know, you have to be able to do the socializing. You have to be able to you know, work the politics and play all this kind of stuff. And, and a lot of that is not fair. You know, like there will be biases, there will be this kind of stuff. But, you know, from a performance perspective, it gives you my, like a lot more chances to, I guess, show what you're worth. So I don't, th I, like both systems aren't perfect. Um, we just have to kind of go with what we think is, is uh, works for, each orchestra, I guess. Yeah, and I, I've I've heard this compared where it's it's the audition process is the best worst way of doing it. <laughs> yeah, so, I guess. Or, yeah, the best bad way. There's just no. It, There's no good way. Yeah, because if you do it where it's like people who know people, then you get into nepotism and all that stuff. If it's you know experienced, then it's like no no young players ever have a chance. So it, it, you have to like, I, I just think we're kind of stuck with it because it's it's the like I said, it's the best worst way of doing it um so that's that's interesting that you've you've had to do both processes now and and uh yet yeah, provide that perspective um there's another good question in the chat um uh what about the city uh or yeah what about the city or the orchestra helped to convince you to leave london for indianapolis like what's what about the iso did you did you really like i it's it's not so much as well um, first of all like coming back to the states is always it's always great i got i grew up here this is home for both me and my wife Mm -hmm. um yeah london london i mean at the end it felt more homey like especially like the last couple months before i left mm -hmm. uh but it it's a totally different culture like even though they're still english speaking just the way everything works is a, is totally different it's it's you, i still felt like a stranger going into that situation because i didn't even know how they did like elementary school so like when i was teaching students like i was like so it, like is that like sixth grade is it like middle school they're like what's middle school yeah and so, and so like nothing made sense like everything i was used to didn't make sense yeah um so and then you know so i i started doing some guesting um or, or just around the states there's a bunch of orchestras who are looking for concert masters and uh indianapolis happened to be one of them uh so when i came here I mean, just seeing the same people you went to school with and like being around a system that you felt comfortable with, it automatically made me very comfortable. Like I didn't have to explain what a quaver is or like a crotch yeah. it is. And it's like, oh, yes. Man, like, that is so the overwhelming. I remember the first I, the first job I ever had was with a touring Broadway show, the first full time job. Uh -huh, uh -huh, and uh -huh. there was a the, the music director was British. And I sat yeah. down for the first rehearsal, and he started saying those words like crotchet and minimum and qu minimum and yeah, yeah, it's yeah. minimum, right? Is that what it's minimum? What it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and 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 quaver and semi quaver, and like I, I literally thought like someone was speaking a foreign. I had no idea what he meant. Yeah, and, exactly. And, 
And then I remember at the first break, these people who I had never met before, they all kind of cried, and, and people were like, what is a crotchet? And I was like, oh, my God, thank God it's, like, you know, I was, like, 21 or 22 years old. Yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah. I was like, thank God it's not me. <laughs> uh, so so nope. for those for those listeners who don't know what we're talking about, in in uh, Europe, particularly the British school, a crotchet is, a, is what a quarter note would be in mm. the U.S., and a minimum is a half note, and yeah. a quaver yeah, okay. is an eighth note. So... They just instead of saying eighth note, they say quaver. Yeah, and then you I get into totally like, that. yeah, yeah. So it's, I got it's, totally roasted on it because I was I was concert I was sitting concert master, and then I'm communicating with the conductors, and of course conductors are well versed in both like like you know crotchet and also quarter note. But the rest of the colleagues, I mean, like they're all great people, but they gave me so much crap. They're like, dude, you're not in America anymore. Use use crotchet. Yeah. So I was like sitting concert master, and I still have no idea what I was talking about. So I ended up writing like a little postcard yeah. and I'm, like sticking it to my stand because that's the only way I could do it. I had to like go home that night after rehearsal and like look on my phone and like memorize what it all meant just so I, yeah. you know, didn't, didn't feel like an idiot anymore. So you, so exactly. you, you kind of always wanted to come back to the States then. And I think so. Yeah. You, you, I think, so. I mean, I mean like once you get back to the, like the States, I mean, Indianapolis is an amazing orchestra. I've heard great things about Zach um and also just like and austin austin being there like he won that job when when we were still in school together like he was he was so young that guy's yeah. a, guy's a prodigy yeah he was 21 i think it's something insane like that uh so i mean i've always i and i knew how well austin played and then so i was like oh boston's principal cello here this is like this is this is a top rated orchestra i'm, I'm excited yeah. about this um and then so when austin actually austin and, and katie mcginnis the uh I don't want to get her title as artistic She's director. Director of artistic planning, I believe. Exactly. Yeah. When when they invited me to Indianapolis and I finally played with them, I was like, "Oh, this this feels great. Yeah, this feels this feels amazing." You know, it's for for from a concert master's perspective, you want to be somewhere where you, um, where you feel like you can actually input something into the orchestra because that I mean, yeah, okay, fine, it feeds into my ego, but like, I obviously I want to like feel like I'm contributing something and I want to be helpful. Um, and I definitely found that with, with Indianapolis, like all the musicians were so incredibly receptive and also attentive to, to all things music. I remember the first rehearsal, uh, Roger Rowe actually came mm-hmm. up to me. He's like, Kevin, we need to like, this needs this, 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 this. I was like, perfect. I understand that. Yeah. Like he tells me exactly what needs to be done. And also, um, is it Jack in, in, the, in the percussion? Timpani, yeah, Jack. Yeah, Jack. Jack also came up to me. He's like, "Hey, Kevin, like, like we need to watch out for this." And then, like, like it's it's rare to find an orchestra that is so open about communicating with you know no one. No one's getting like upset. It's like, oh man, they told me to do this. Oh, it was like, ah, oh, it's like no ego there when we walk through the door. Like we we all have the same goal. We want to put on the best possible concerts as we can, and we all like enjoy the process of making music together. So I think. I had a really positive uh, first experience sitting next to Phil is always fun. Mm-hmm. I, and like just working with Eugene uh, back in the day, it was, it was, it was Payming, except he left us for, for now. I know, Whatever. he left but, us. But, <laughs> um, and also, yeah, well, well I, I will say I remember that concert where it was Brahms 2 was your first yeah. time ever playing with us. And I remember it was yeah. the first rehearsal and we got into the finale. And, you know, Brahms 2 is pretty epic. I mean, let's be honest. Yeah, it is very it's a pretty epic, epic yeah. symphony. And I remember, like, you were, we got to the last movement, and uh-huh. I remember it was, like, the climax of the last movement, and yeah. there's just, there's a feeling that we all get. And I know, like, runners have runners high, and I really think there's, like, a performance high. Um, yes. In the best means, in the best way possible. But yeah. I remember we got to that climax, and I'm actually feeling it right now. It is like, <laughs> you were, like, Go, just go into town and i remember yeah. i looked at roger he plays oboe and he looked back at me and we were just like this guy there's there was something <laughs> there was just something different about the way that you were leading right, and the way right. that we felt with you that it was just like instantaneous you know um just the connection yep. and so it, it was just and and it sounds like you you kind of felt the same way where it's just and like you said too like collegially it's one of the nicest or i mean you know everyone i mean we've all seen the inside of each other's houses you know, yeah. like, like we, yeah, we sure. have parties, we, we communicate with each other. We know about each other's lives. And I think that that's kind of mm-hmm. rare, just not because of anything bad, but just like, 
you know, it's not always, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's not always that way. Oop, did we lose you? Yeah. So, oh, sorry. Oh, it, it you cut out for a second. I'm, I'm back. Yeah, there you are. Okay. Are you there? Yep. Hey. Yeah, no, no, but I, I totally agree. But the thing is, like, it's I, I don't think Master is not going to make, like, as much difference as you said. I mean, the thing is, it has to be mutual. So the thing is, like, the yeah. the the level of the orchestra has to be there first and then i can like input my little bit of like ideas on top of that um because me by myself i'm not i'm not the indianapolis symphony orchestra i'm not gonna sound you know that great by myself so it's definitely a collective effort and i i just got the sense that we we worked really well together and it felt it, it felt easy for me it was it was, it was, it was natural it was second nature yeah absolutely um well great uh so Another good question in the chat. Um, what are your thoughts on how you can serve as an ambassador to the Indianapolis community at large? I know you've already been doing sort of some work on that, especially with these concerts around town. But like, you know, the, the role of the concert master is kind of it's, it's a little mysterious in a way, because, mm -hmm. yes, you're the you know, you're the first violin. You, you play the solos and stuff. But it's also there's a there's a expectation that you are, you know, kind of the link between like the musicians and the community in mm -hmm, a way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, well, I mean, the, the thing is, I, I, I just like talking to people. I don't know. I don't know. How, there's there's yeah. no, like, there's no weird way of, there's no special way of saying it. Like I like being with people. I'm an extroverted person. I like learning about, you know, different people and different cultures. And like, I, I just like meeting new people. That's, I don't know how to sugarcoat it. Um, mm -hmm. But I also find that, you know, in a smaller town, I mean, obviously compared to London, Indianapolis is a, is a, is a bit of a smaller town. Um, everyone's got their own story and everyone's got a connection as to why they enjoy you know, classical music. Um, you know, we hear so much that like, you know, Yuletide is, is so connected with the with Indianapolis. And you're like, oh, you know, some donors will be like, oh, you know, like my father took me to Yuletide when I was a kid and this kind of stuff. Yeah. like the provenance is amazing like all this kind of history like there's a real the iso has like a real foot in the history of indianapolis and that is super super interesting to me like i mean call me a sentimental person but i find all this kind of stuff very very interesting and we're just basically along for the ride and i'm sure you know kids of future generations are going to be looking back and be like i remember when christopher bansky was music director um mm -hmm. you know it's it's all this kind of stuff so I, yeah, if, if you want to start a conversation, like, come, come, come up and talk to me. Like, I, I'm, yeah, like, I'm all for I have it. a feeling you're going to be the guy who's, you know, you're going to be out at uh, Bluebeard and people are just going to walk up to you. Hey, it's, it's Kevin Lynn. He's is that concert master? How you doing? Is that like the brunch place, the, the garage -y brunch place? Uh, you might be thinking of Milk Tooth. Is Milk that Tooth. That, I'm thinking Milk Tooth. Yeah. I'm still figuring out. Bluebeard is across the street. Okay. Uh, Bluebeard's my favorite restaurant. That actually cool. is a good. So I was going to ask you what what your favorite like restaurant or bar that you've been to is is Milk Tooth like high up there on your Milk list? Tooth is pretty I I've, I've been there with my wife like twice we, we we always go there like the day after I finish my week in Indianapolis so it's always a bit of like a relaxation place um mm -hmm. I, I don't yeah I, I don't know the places very well I've I've been to Indy I think five times but you know when you're there for a week you're half the time yeah. you're, jet, you're jet lagged and then the other half you're like busy <laughs> working so uh, yeah. Yeah, Jacob Joyce, who's the associate conductor, has been taking me to Garden Table. That's a really nice. Garden Table is great. That, yeah, right? Garden Table is really great. Um, yeah, uh, Bakersfield is also. I, I basically Mass Ave. I've I've, I've I've like explored. Um, I really need to do more. Maybe maybe you can you can show me some some places when definitely or, and and if anybody sees Kevin and I out together or just Kevin, just yeah, come hang out with to say hi. That's, yeah, come yeah, hang out with us more than Mary. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Great. So, uh, this is also another question from from my lovely wife. I have to shout her out, Miss cool. Miss Brittany Sutton. She she wanted to know what pieces are you most excited to play with the ISO. And I'll also add on to this: what performance so far for you has stood out the most that you've played with us so far? Okay, first part of the question: what am I really looking forward to? Um, I'm scheduled to play the Brook Violin Concerto. I think it's in April of 2021 with Peter Unjin. Oh, all right. So that that I'm really looking forward to because like that's I've never played that piece with orchestra. Um, yeah, I'm just really looking forward, to, and I think 
I think the second second piece on that uh, the the symphony on that concert is supposed to be Tchaikovsky six or one of the Tchaikovsky yeah, symphonies. Tchaikovsky six. Tchaikovsky. Yeah, Tchaikovsky. Like Tchaikovsky. literally two of my favorite pieces. Like Tchaikovsky six. Oh, I will always have like a place in my heart. Like we. So are you gonna do the uh, the honorable thing and come back and yes. and play Tchaikovsky six? All right, well, my man. It's, it's, yeah, of course I am. I mean, like I, I it's it's fun for me. Why would I miss out on that experience? I'm not like oh, trying to go home. Or well, it's good to know that you're a go getter and you're. Uh, no, no. Do, that's great. Listen, like I think, I think, I can like my wife and I like we we've gone through and anyone who's gone through the London circuit like the workload in America compared to London is is much lighter. So like it's it's not it's not that much work to like play concerto and okay like yeah like, to play concerto and then like go back and play yeah. symphony. Um, yeah, the touring the touring life in London was rough. It was so rewarding. It was so much fun, but it is so taxing on your body. Um, yeah. you know, the 6 a.m., you know, check-in times at Heathrow, you know, you, you land in Hamburg at like, I don't know, like noon or something. You get to your hotel, you have like three hours to rest and then you do a sound check and then you play the concert that night. So literally you wake up in London at your home and you're playing a concert in like El Fajon of money like that night. Yeah. And then the next morning you're on like a 7 a.m. like Eurostar to the next, next town over. So it's, I mean, like it was, yeah. it was tough. So. If you if I ever start so, slacking work wise, you got to call me out on it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, um, that's great. And then and then what what has been your most memorable performance so far that you've played? Most memorable? Oh God, Eroica was really nice. So so Beethoven's sure, yeah. that was amazing. And I think that was featured on From the Vault uh, not too long ago. If you guys yeah. listeners haven't heard it, make sure to go take a listen. Um, that's a great. Yeah, that was a, that that was that was amazing. That was really, really good. Yeah, uh, that was great. Um, and I wasn't a part of performing that one, but I, I listened to it. And it was uh-huh. great. Um, my my favorite one, was, well, I, I mean, I, I have two. I can have two favorites. Um, so I love the Brahms too. That was yes. like, that was great. Uh-huh. And then actually the uh, the Walton symphony oh, yes. that you came and did with us. Yeah, that was a crazy piece. But That's it hard. was also with Peter Ungen. Yes, it was super hard. But I remember it was it was really memorable. And I think that was the second. It was the second or third time you had come back. That was my and, that was my uh, second one, my second one for sure. Yeah, yeah, and that was that was great. Um, I really enjoyed. Yeah, Walton one was fun, and it was it was, it was also also nice to work with Peter Ungen. And like like when, when I met him, I didn't realize he was like super super British. So like it was it was actually really nice because I, I I had just flown in from London, so I was just like, oh man, this like the, the empire is following me everywhere. Uh, yeah, right. yeah, but it was it, it's just yeah, small world, small world. Yeah, yeah, he's great. Um, so do you have any particular story about like your violin? Cause I know like some people play on these like crazy, uh, you know, I don't want to say ancient, but vintage yeah. violins, you know, from like the 1600s made by some famous maker uh-huh. in Italy. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, do you, is, is yours, does yours have any sort of lore to it? I, I, I think so. Um, yeah, I was, I was lucky enough to be, uh, I, I was basically given a very nice violin while I was in school. So like throughout, uh, you know, Colburn and Curtis. I was I was sponsored by the uh, Chimei Foundation in Taiwan. They've been super super generous in loaning me violins for for when I studied. Uh, but then uh, when I got the job in London, that's kind of when the uh, I guess the support kind of dwindled a little bit. I, it makes total sense. They 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 sponsor kids who are like still in school, and I think what they do is great. Um, mm-hmm. But that presents a problem for me. You know, first yeah, uh, yes. entering the workforce is like, oh crap! Now I don't, now I don't have a violin. Um, but I really have to hand it over to my friend, uh, my friends actually, at Teresio. Uh, they're they're a, an online auction company that also deals with private sales. Um, but my friend there, uh, Carlos, uh, really really helped me out. He hooked me up with uh, with a guy that was trying to sell a uh, Galliano and gave me like a great price for it. Um, yeah. So seriously, if it wasn't for him, like I, I mean, there's like, there's no way I can like afford a million dollar violin like straight out of school, like or even a million dollar violin is is basically life savings and like you know your four hundred one k everything bundled in one. Um, yeah. So Carlos got me. Yeah, it's a Joseph Galliano made in Naples in seventeen eighty, um, cool. and he basically he brought me. He's like, yo, dude, like this is in the price range that you're looking at. Um, 
you know, like, let me talk to the owners. We'll work something out. And like, he totally threw me a bone there. So I've been playing on this violin ever since. Um, yeah. So big shout out to, uh, to Teresio over there. Yeah, that's great. And for those who don't know, violins are absurdly expensive. Insanely like, expensive. I, I, I complain because I have to buy my reeds and buy clarinets every 10 years, but my clarinets are like, you know, five to seven thousand dollars replaced every 10 years mm-hmm. a violin can be like four million dollars yeah, yeah. You know, like and then and then that's not even getting into the bow that's not, yeah exactly hundreds of thousands of dollars sometimes so it's essentially it's quite a i remember i we were i was in previous to here i was in the richmond symphony and josh bell was soloing with us and he dropped his bow and he made some joke and Jess was like, oh, you know, a quarter million dollar bow, just drop it on the ground. And we were all like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, how is that even possible? I mean, that was like more than like 10 times my net worth at that point in time. Yeah, it's, um, it's insane. It's insane. Because, yeah, I mean, yeah. a lot of this, you know, there are collectors and they, they see violins or, or not the old uh, string instruments as as art. So they basically appreciate the same way like a like fine art does. Except that we use it as for for literally for our livelihood for our jobs, so um, mm-hmm. if you can jump on that bandwagon when you can, like you know, a lot of people will will buy a, buy a violin, hold it for their entire career, twenty thirty years, and then sell it off, and that's their retirement. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, so Edwin in the chat asks, uh, can you discuss your process and preparation for joining a new orchestra? And then a two part question too. Uh, what if any changes, you know, obviously the orchestra is going to go through a music director search, yeah. you know, for the foreseeable future. Uh, what if any changes, you know, do you anticipate knowing that a new conductor will be joining after your first season? I, th- well, I think it's always good to be flexible. I don't have any concrete plans. as like, oh, I'm going to go in. I'm going to change this. No, because like, I mean, first of all, we've been locked. We, we, I mean, in terms of coronavirus, like we've been, we haven't been together in, what almost four or five months now so by the time we get yeah by the time we're back together like we won't have seen each other in in a long time basically and the thing is like once we're back together it could be a totally different orchestra playing wise um Mm -hmm. so we just have to i just you know everyone just has to keep in mind that we need to be flexible um but always play together work together um, and basically my job as concert master is kind of just to facilitate that everyone is working working in, in order i'm basically the wd-40 of uh <laughs> of musicians uh yeah so i just make sure everyone's working together and we can work as smoothly as possible as, as possible um and then that way the or the conductor whoever's standing up there uh can basically give their input and uh tell us what they want and that goes with any sort of music director that comes into town I'm, i mean no matter who it is i'm sure we will find someone of the highest caliber um you know we 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 have high hopes that we're going to bring really good talent into indianapolis uh yeah so it's 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 a lot to look forward to make yeah make sure to stay in touch yeah absolutely and, and it is a really exciting time uh you know obviously we have a new concert master um, we have a lot of new uh, principal players and just a you know, it's we just all we want to do is just make music for our community. For sure, um, that's what we want to do. That's what we love to do, and we love seeing people. We love bringing joy to people, and we love being a part of Indianapolis. It's a very special place for me. You know, I I had sort of this realization after my first season. I was like, you know, because I was you know gung ho and mm-hmm. eager and young, and I was like, oh, yeah. I'm just gonna keep moving up the audition ladder. But after my first season here, I was like, man, I kind of I kind of like it here. Like, yeah, I might of course. Actually, just stay here because I. You know, and I met my wife here. It's very, a very special place, and I think For that, sure. you know, we just, we just desperately want to bring music back to our community in any way that we can, um, and we hope to do that as soon as possible. And we're already doing that with our neighborhood concerts and everything that's been going on. Definitely, definitely. And I think another thing that really drew me to Indianapolis is the his, the history of the ISO. Like historically, the ISO was, was a touring orchestra like you see you walk into our rehearsal hall like there's there's posters of like oh they were in vienna they were in all these places so these musicians that work for the indianapolis symphony made the trek all the way to basically the mecca of classical music uh, you know vienna germany all these places they made an experience there and they brought it back to share it with the people of indianapolis and i think that's also uh 
the great thing about us as a as a orchestra is we are basically culture ambassadors. Like we bring different cultures and different experiences back to people who probably won't get a chance to see the Berlin Phil or probably won't get a chance to see the Vienna Phil live. But the thing is like what we do is basically the same thing as as as, as they're doing. And if we're able to, you know, perform in the same halls as as these European giants, you know, the people of Indianapolis essentially get the same experience back at home. Yeah. And they also, you know, orchestras are very, I was talking about this with one of my recent podcast guests and, you know, he said he used to be very studious about, um, you know, knowing the different sounds. So like Cleveland yeah. or Chicago yeah. or Pittsburgh or whatever. And I think that, that is really unique to each individual orchestra in each individual city. Yes. You remember I had a, I had a friend, a, a violist come through town my first season in the orchestra and she came to a concert we did Mahler 4. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I have my own observations about how the concert went or whatever. And she, she just came back to me glowing. And she says, like, I just, I love the sound of your orchestra. She said, she said, it's so authentic. Yeah. Is what she said. Yeah. She said, it just felt very honest. It's like you weren't, you guys weren't trying to do something or mm -hmm. be somebody else. You were just trying to be the Indianapolis Symphony. And I think yeah. that, that we are, you know, it, it, it is rooted, you know, like you said, I mean, we used to go to Europe and do all this stuff and, and hopefully we will again soon. Yeah, um, absolutely. But yeah, and I, th I think that each, you know, each orchestra definitely has its, 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 own, its own identity. Absolutely. So um, can, can, can we talk about, uh, you know, do you have any other like hobbies or interests <laughs> outside of music? Like I, th it's, it's always the uh, taboo question with musicians. Cause everyone's like, no, I just practice. I just play music. No, of course um, not. Of course it, not. No. But I, I figured you have, there's something that, that people don't know about you. Uh, I don't know. I'm not a. I, I, I don't know. I'm not a very interesting person. But um, <laughs> I, I think with this interview, you proved that wrong. No. <laughs> um, what am I into, Evan? What am I into? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I was I was really into like. Uh, is anyone into photography? Do you know Do you know much about photography? Yeah, I well, I I actually just posted a video today. Um, I got a fancy new camera here. Is that a DSLR? Um, and it's a mirrorless camera. It's mirrorless. a Sony A sixty four hundred. Oh, very nice, very nice. Uh, yeah. So I actually the other day I just I had the morning off, and I mean I have every morning off now, but I chose to not fill that morning with anything. But I walked around Indianapolis and I just took video shots of different parts of the city. That's amazing. Um, and and actually in our orchestra we have a number of people. So Mike Musinski's he used to shoot um for he went to northwestern university and he used to shoot the athletic events oh wow um and then bert witzel also does some stuff he's a bass player yeah, yeah. and ingrid ingrid bellman takes pictures often of flowers and nature and stuff so there are a lot of people uh, yeah 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 so i was yeah i was i was really into photography for a while uh i did when i was a student in la i did like a lot of the headshots for people some street photography stuff um yeah i i really got into like spent way too much money on like cameras and lenses and all that kind of stuff um but i, I was... didn't realize how expensive these these things are yeah, i was like exactly it, it you know it's like <laughs> this is gonna sound funny but it's like it's like buying an engagement ring because yeah. they, they're like oh you get this nice engagement ring they have a nice picture of it uh -huh. and then they're like oh and then by the way you have to buy the stone as well exactly, exactly you know exactly. and that's how the cameras are it's like you buy the thing and it's expensive and then you're like oh crap now i have to buy a bunch of lenses for it exactly and the thing so, is like once you get into a I, I, i'm getting too detailed but like once you buy like a nikon lens it only fits with like a nikon body you can't like put it yeah. onto like a on like a canon or a sony so like once you're in a system like they really rope you in like, it's like this is the only thing you can use yeah. unless you sell all all of your gear and then you got to switch <laughs> yeah they faction you out pretty well i i learned that with the the sony um i guess the sony's are but well i'm not gonna get into it but the sony's are are supposed to be really good for video which yeah they're great in. they're phenomenal um but yeah i know that like mike's really and i think he's the i think he's a nikon guy okay okay um, yeah i'm on the whole canon ecos i was a nikon guy and then i tried a sony i tried the, when the sony a7 first came out that was like the first yeah mirrorless ds uh full frame camera I, I was like toying with that for I bought it for a little bit, but it was mm -hmm. it was it was like I hate lag, so I can't deal with lag. And then when it first came, it was it was amazing, but it was still a little slow mm -hmm. for what I was used to. So I sold that off, um, and so I've been I've been using a I've been I had a Canon sixty for a while, Canon sixty, and then I usually just use like a fifty millimeter i one point four. Um, that basically does it for me. Uh, cool. Yeah. 
Sorry, I must have lost you somewhere in the, in the No, 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 that's good. No, you didn't lose me at all. I was with you. You probably lost some of our, our viewers. Yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> no, that's okay. I That was my fault. Um, yeah, but, you know, I, I think it's really important for us, for anybody to have hobbies outside of what you do for work. Oh, for it, sure. Otherwise, it's just so easy to, to get, you know, I, yeah. you know, it took me a while to get to that point because I, I was just so, music is the only thing. I just yeah, want yeah, to be a yeah. musician, that's it. Yeah. But but being a well-rounded person and having other interests, it mm -hmm. it kind of there's this. I was talking with this uh, the executive director of the Milwaukee Symphony. I, mm -hmm. I had a conversation with him a few months ago, and he explained to me this concept called Ikigai, which is this oh, Japanese yeah. sort of like wellness uh, Venn diagram. Yes, so yes. there's like four separate things, and uh -huh. if you have all four of those things, like your life is complete. Yes. And if you're missing one of those things, it'll like tell you what you're feeling like or what you're lacking. So it's like what you're good at what you like to do, what you can make money with, and what's what the world needs. So right. those are the four. And so you want to find via your different things. So for me, for work, it's like what I like, what I'm good at, what I can make money with. Mm -hmm. But I don't I don't have something that can make the world. I mean, you can argue the world. Obviously, music makes the world better. You're making but, a world a better place for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, I, but I've always craved that sort of volunteerism and like, yeah. you know, really helping people. Right. And so like, yes. I've been searching for different things. Like, what is it going to, what, what do I need for that? So if uh, anybody wants to check it out, it's, it's spelled I K I, um, G A I, I believe Ikigai. So it's, it's kind of an interesting concept, but I feel like for musicians, it's really important because it's, it's so easy to get caught up and be missing one of those things. For sure. For sure. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. I like going back to the whole hobbies thing. Yeah. I think it goes in phases because I've definitely had like Things I were re I was really interested in. I, I I tend to like fixate on something really quick and then I get out of it really quick too. Um, I don't know mm -hmm. if that's good or bad for my wallet, but like, I remember <laughs> I yeah I was really into whiskey for a while. Like I collected like all the oh, like nice. like you know old world whiskeys and that kind of stuff. And I had a little I had a little stint with watches, but that was definitely way too expensive. Um, <laughs> that one will hit the wallet for sure. That one hits real hard. But yeah. yeah, and then my wife says the same thing. She 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 gets into things really fast and uh -huh. gets out of them, and it tends to be expensive. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And then like I got yeah. obsessed with the. Do you know? Do you know what a boosted board is? I don't. For those for those that see like the Casey Neistat like YouTube vlogs and all that kind of stuff, like you'll know exactly what I'm talking. About. It's a essentially it's it's a um, it's an electric skateboard. Okay. So like I, I, I got one of those in London and I basically like commuted to work with it and like it it was amazing, but it was like the most dangerous thing ever ever and my, my wife like hates that thing. Uh, yeah. Well well when you get to Indianapolis you can you can experience the scooters which have now taken over downtown. Oh I know, I know. Actually that was a <laughs> that was a big big reason why I also like to, to go to any like the bird scooters. Yeah. Yeah, I was like oh, I love those. They're, I love those things. <laughs> yeah, they're all over the place, man. Sometimes they're in places they shouldn't be like in the canal. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, great, Kevin. Do you have anything else you want to talk about or, you know, say yeah, anything on your mind? Not really. I'm just really looking forward to actually starting work. I mean, hopefully we can get through this uh this pandemic safely and everyone comes out of the other side okay. Um but I'm really just looking forward to, to starting in Indianapolis and working with all of you guys. Yeah. Do you have any idea like where you're going to live and have you checked out any of the neighborhoods? I've or... been looking. I, I think, I think I'm going to stick with downtown. Although like Conrad's house, I've, I've been seeing like part, parts of his place, like on, uh, uh, on our zoom calls and that kind of stuff. His place looks, oh, yeah, he, he's fancy. Yeah. He's got a nice, he, nice place. He's got a nice place. I, he's coming up on the podcast on, on the, on the, on the show soon. Yeah, actually, you know, in a couple of minutes, I'll I will I will reveal our next guests. Yeah, so you'll 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 get a little inside tour of probably his house and that kind of stuff. It's it's nice. I was like, oh, wherever he's living must be a good place to live. Yeah, there's you know, aside from immediate downtown, I I, I kind of live there. I live in the Canal District. Okay, cool. Um, so I live sort of by where the Kroger is. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, there's a lot of great neighborhoods. So there's like uh, Fountain Square and Bates yeah. Hendricks and yeah. like. You know these these neighborhoods that are that aren't in the mile square, uh -huh, uh -huh. but they're just slightly outside of it. I see, um, and they're great. You know, a lot of like remodeled houses, a lot of really cool neighborhood things, um, and then of course there's like the old north side, which is just north. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it, there's lots of great great places to live and, and and things popping up here and there. But 
Yeah, man. Well, we, we uh, you know, I know I can't wait for you to get here and start playing with us every week. It's really going to be great. Definitely. Yeah. Um, sure. And, uh, you know, welcome to Indianapolis. Thank I'm so you, glad we you. could we could do this today. And you you were an honorable first guest. Thanks for being the guinea pig. I hope I did an okay job. No, this is amazing. Uh, Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, I think that it's probably a good time now to sort of go through who's going to be up next so kevin thanks so much for your time thank you and uh yeah we'll talk to you soon talk soon um so i'm very excited to present our next two guests for the next two evenings so on july 21st uh conrad jones who's our principal trumpet is going to be joining me um conrad obviously amazing player and shout out to his amazing uh brass band concert the other day uh sunday night it was it was absolutely incredible um they sounded so amazing, and, and uh, from what I understand, Conrad and Riley Giampaolo uh, did all the arrangements, uh, which is, it was just absolutely fantastic. Uh, so shout out to him. Uh, we'll go more in depth with that next week when we talk to him. And then on July 28th, Jennifer Kristen, who is one of my favorite people in the whole wide world, um, will be uh, joining us. She's our principal oboist, and she's always fascinating to talk to. Uh, she's had her hands full for the last couple of years. She has a little little baby uh, named Elliot, who's just the cutest thing in the world. And so it'll, I'm really looking forward to talking with Jennifer and having some more great conversations uh, over the next couple of weeks. So if you want to know when we're going live, make sure you follow us, uh, su subscribe to us if you can. Remember, if you connect your Twitch account to, Am to your Amazon Prime account, you can subscribe to us for free. Uh, it's totally free uh, if you have Amazon Prime. Um, and then uh, for the musicians of the ISO concerts uh, coming up, make sure to just follow the musicians of the ISO on Facebook uh, for upcoming events and go to our website, isomusicians.org. It's right over, see if I can get, uh, right there, isomusicians.org. Uh, make sure to go there, subscribe to our newsletter. You can uh, find out what we've been up to, what, what, what the latest happenings are. And then, of course, uh, follow, us on, follow us on social media. So we have Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, daily updates from what we're doing. You'll find out where the latest concerts are going to be. And then, of course, I, I got to give another shout out to the people at Twitch for really providing us with such a great platform to bring this kind of content with, uh, to you. And we're hoping, uh, knock on wood, sometime in the near future, we can actually start live streaming concerts on the platform. And, and that'll be really, really exciting. Um, so once again, uh, you can follow us on Twitch by clicking the little follow icon with the heart in it and make a free account, connect your Twitch account to your Amazon prime account and you can subscribe for us to us for free every 30 days, uh, totally free. Um, and yeah, thanks so much for everyone for joining us for this, for our first ever live stream. Uh, I hope you join us next week, uh, July 21st, 8 PM Eastern time for our interview with Conrad Jones, principal trumpet. And that's sure to be a, a really exciting evening. So thanks so much to everybody, and we will see you next week.